the harmony valve was conceived initially over 20 years ago. Um, and it was designed as a product to treat patients who had either had you know, no surgery on their pulmonary valve or had had a, surg a prior surgical repair in the area of the pulmonary valve and were left with severe regurgitation or leakage of that valve resulting in you know, dial progressive dilation of the right ventricle. Um, most of the, well, all of the prior transcatheter pulmonary valves prior to Harmony were not really designed and are not FDA approved for treatment of that patient population. They're, they're approved for valve replacements in patients who have existing conduits or existing surgical pulmonary valve replacements. Um, so the Harmony valve is unique in that it was specifically designed, developed, and is now you know approved for use in patients who have what we can what we call either native or surgically augmented right ventricular outflow tracts and are left with severe pulmonary regurgitation. So that's what makes this unique. It's also unique in that it is in the in the pulmonary space. It's one of now only two. Uh, what we call self-expanding valves. So valves that are, you know, ex have the expand on their own. They're designed to, ex to expand, you know, be released and expand to be placed in very large blood vessels or large outflow tracts. So that's another piece of it, another aspect of its design that makes it unique. The way that this trial works, and this is typical of a lot of trials like this, is it is comprised of a, several different groups of patients. So in this case, the data that we were, you know, that we have collected and that we presented most recently at the SKY meeting, um, SCAI, is a, a combination of three different groups. It's uh, the early feasibility study patients, the pivotal trial patients, and the continued access patient group. Um, so that was 86 patients that had been implanted, and we have up to now five years of follow-up on that cohort. Um, and the value of these types of data is that, one, it's very well monitored and very well controlled. It's all collected prospectively. So you're, you are controlling as much as you can control about the population of patients, um, and you have the best kind of control over their follow-up. So you're more likely to get really more complete follow-up data um, that is consistent across the whole patient group, as opposed to doing other studies where you're looking backwards and you may not have data points for everybody and you're missing some patients and you're missing some data. This is ensure the doing it this way is obviously much more resource intensive, but it allows you to collect as much data as you possibly can so that when we're making determinations or decisions about how well the valve works and how effective it is, we have the most accurate data that we can possibly have. Um, and so that's the value of this, the value of this particular study and this particular group of patients is that these group, these patients will be tracked for a decade, right? So we're going to have 10 years of pretty closely monitored data that we can use to make decisions about how well the valve functions and how well patients feel after they get the valve replaced. What and what we're already, well, I mean, what we're already seeing, right? The 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 reason that these particular data are important is this is sort of the first set of data where we can actually look at an um, a combination of how well patients are feeling. Um, as well as what are the real world risk factors for valve replacement over time? So, you know, we've been following these patients now for up to five years. Um, and some of the, and these, some of these data have been presented in earlier forms and earlier publications. But, um, and what we know is that patients feel better. If the data, there's data that they all feel better, um, that their heart responds. So we have MRI follow-up that shows that the heart size shrinks down back to closer to normal size and that the efficiency of the heart of the heart function improves with valve replacement. So we know that we've seen that from earlier data, but what's really important about this particular set of data is that we're now starting to get a sense of what, what are the real world, how, how well is this valve going to function in, in the real world over time? A lot of the things that we're interested in, how durable is the valve? You know, what are the long-term risk factors? These things are all time-dependent variables. Like, I, you have to have time to see 
what the real numbers are going to be. So we're, we're starting this, this iteration of the data set is starting to tell us what, how, how this valve is going to perform over time. And what we're seeing is that the performance is good, is excellent. The, you know, the, the rates of leakage of the valve or regurgitation of the valve are very low at three years and at up at five for the patients for whom we have five-year data. Um, the, you know, the longer term, midterm, I should say, really it is the midterm, the midterm complications seem to be low. So we're not seeing, you know, new late deaths. We're not seeing new late arrhythmias. We're not seeing new late valve thrombosis um, so far in this, in these, in this cohort of patients at the kind of the three to five year time frame. Um, and then we all, again, like I said, we know from prior studies, and this is preserved, is that they feel better and their heart functions better. So all of those things are very valuable when we're counseling families about, you know, why they should have this done um, and when they should have this done. Like what, at what point in their life is it, is it appropriate to have this procedure performed? Well, the key takeaways are the, are the things that I just mentioned, which is that, you know, the valve, the valve performance at three to five years remains excellent, that the incidence of midterm problems with the valve remains very low, and that we really didn't see any new deaths, valve dysfunction, arrhythmia, or valve thrombosis in this time frame, um, and that the heart responds favorably to valve replacement, and that has remained consistent throughout the three to five year time frame, and that people feel better, again, throughout the three to five year time frame. So that these are all sustained levels of good performance um, of the valve that seems to translate into people feeling better.